So we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 6.09, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Good evening, everyone. This is the Region 7 Stakeholder Advisory Committee meeting on this Thursday, January 26th. And we wanted to get started. And this is officially our call to order. And we'll start as we always do. Um, I'm not going to read our statement. We can do that so many times now. Um, but we'll start with public comment. I thought we had one guest who joined us here in person this evening. So we'll yeah, still, one online. Yeah. So um, I'll ask if there is anyone from the public who would like to comment or provide any statements regarding what we've done so far. And if you're an attendee and you want to raise your hand and speak, let us know and we'll recognize you. So I'm not seeing anything right now. Are you guys seeing anything? Oh, no. oh we do have. Let me. Uh, okay. Mr. Hyatt, we are. Uh, can you hear me? Off mute. Yes, you can speak now. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to check in. Uh, Patrick, we emailed about the um, February 6th meeting uh, on the uh, Ridgely Avenue corridor if the sign up has gone out in the status of all of that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna make an announcement about that. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to steal sure. your thought. No, that's okay, that's okay. Did, did you have anything, did you have anything else for the for the public comment portion of the, of the evening? No, that was really my only question, thank you. Okay, okay, sure, I'll address that um, in our announcements in just a, just a minute. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to um, add commentary at this point? So um, seeing no one forward at this point, we'll remind everyone that we're gonna do this in each of our meetings. So if they'd like to provide comment, they can either um, firsthand or they can do it through the website. The instructions are on the hub page for Region 7. So they can email the group individually or um, go to Region 7 at aaccounty.org. Okay. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close public comment and we're going to move into old business. First old business agenda item is approval of the meeting notes from our last meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review those? And were there any comments or corrections that maybe feels we should make to those meeting minutes as they were prepared? And we all, I'm sorry, I didn't, I also didn't get a chance to review them, but I did review emails set up by Patrick from the county. I want to make sure we understand the word consensus now. And I think we didn't take the vote last time when we changed the vote because we thought it had to be 100% unanimous. But in what I believe the county set it out, that was not the so did that get corrected or edited in the minutes? I apologize. Uh, well, I think to make the minutes reflect that we were going to have a, dis a brief discussion about consensus um, as part of one of our agenda items here. So it seems sure like the, we, the meeting went a certain way because we gave to unanimous this definition of consensus, which is not what Patrick said. Right. Um, let me see if I have that. That'll come under the charter review. Okay. So we'll go ahead and spend a little time on that as our next agenda. Back to comments on the notes. Okay, I know I already did them. I thought they were well done. I think whoever takes the time to do this. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as they were presented? I think motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. One opposed? So I think we get some with the vote of approval and go ahead and put those in the record. So okay, so our next um, old business item is the charter review. 
So this goes back to what John was talking about. And Patrick sent around information, I believe, that described how the process for us to review this is the first review is consensus. I did some research myself, and consensus is not necessarily unanimous. Unanimous consent is carried in Robert's Rules of Order as a component of how they would handle our rules. The review process is a bit different. We work to get to consensus. And if there is a problem with one of the things that's proper, the person who has an issue with it is asked to provide an adjustment to the language so that we can see if that can be incorporated successfully into the discussion. And if it can, then we can decide together and we all agree to it. It's not a vote, it's just a show of agreement. If we can't get to what consensus is in that in that way, by the way, consensus is not a it's not unanimous, it's a majority. Usually it's a large majority. Some some things say 75%, some say 95%, but it's really you know it's we can decide. If we can't get to consensus and um, decide not to table the discussion, there's only a modest amount of dissension from that point, we can go to a vote. Our charter says the vote is two thirds. So um, that means that we just carry the vote. And the decision and the motion carries. So again, the intent is to see if we can get as much support for the statement as we can without going to a vote. But in order to keep us moving forward, because we have a lot to cover, we'll go to a vote and we can't get to consensus. Is that clear to everyone? Have I described that correctly? And let's start with you, Patrick. Does that sound Desiree, does that sound how, how you see it? I think, yeah, I think I think so. Just want to make sure staff thought that that was right. Lily, you had your hand up. So yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with consensus in committees, and the concept of tabling is very important in consensus building. But I don't see that we have the opportunity or time to table things and come back with improvements to the language. So I, I just offer that. That's something I tried to express last week because I many times if you're not getting to consensus. People that would like to offer changes will request tabling something and coming back later with more research or a smaller group group offering a revision. And I don't feel like the way we're we're Blowing through everything that we have time to do that. Right. So I'll talk to that for just okay. a minute. The way um, the email that Patrick sent earlier today was that let's say there's 50 things in each one of these groups. The majority of those are ones that we really don't have to discuss because through the questionnaire, we just, you know, essentially consensus was achieved that mechanism. There's also a place on each one of those to have made a comment about whether there's a text change or there's a general concern about the entire state. So everyone was invited to make an adjustment there if they wanted to. Now, um, these discussions are going to be focused tonight on the ones where we think there could not be consensus or there's questions that we can answer. But the way I understand it is Patrick and Desiree are going to compile whatever kind of hanging pieces we have as a group for all of the five areas that we need to make recommendation. And we can discuss those in more detail after we get through this first round. So my response is I think there will be an opportunity to address those before we decide as a group that we're in support of all of them. So the process that we're following now is let's see what we can get resolved in short order, and I think there's only a few tonight based on the questionnaire responses, five items, or questions or comments. Yeah. So we'll discuss those tonight, see if we can get to consensus, but then we'll look at all of the commentary, the ones that were in question together and make an adjustment. Yeah, so, does that sound right? It, it does, and to that point, um, we're, we've been working to try to process all of the all of the comments that, that you all gave us on these strategies. So we're, we're 
compiling everything into a spreadsheet, all of the comments, um, and and then looking at the uh, strategy to, to see if it needs some revision based on some of these comments. And we are going to propose some revisions. Some of them are, a lot of them are kind of wordsmithing, um, a little bit less significant. I'm not sure that those necessarily need to come back to the committee for discussion. Um, others may be a little bit more significant and may need to come back. And so what, we, what we're aiming to do is to have this um, spreadsheet complete by um, February 3rd, which is Friday of next week, week I believe. And we want to we want to have that complete and send that to you all to have a look a look at, um, and then address any of the remaining strategies that need um, need group discussion at the February thirteenth uh, meeting, and try to try to just ensure that we have consensus on all of the strategies. And all of this would be in um, preparation. We're trying to get. Um, a milestone of putting these draft strategies out for public review in the month of March. And um, so that's that's the goal. And uh, but it, it's also not the, the these strategies are our draft. Ours was the first cut at this that we gave to you. And, and we're, we want to incorporate you all's comments. And then the public is going to have an opportunity to comment and we'll incorporate their comments as well. They're also going to be folded into the, the full draft plan that will also go out for public review um, later this, this year. And there, you know, by that point, there shouldn't be a whole lot of changes to come through, but there might be, you know. So yeah, go ahead. Is the public invited to add? Did they could. They could. They could. Yeah. I mean, when we when we did a similar process in Plan 2040, we we get um, we get some 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 very good comments from the public, and I will say we we read every single one, um, even if even if it's one comment made about one thing that differs from everybody every other comment, but we, we do read all of them and take them into consideration. So that's that's our. Um, that's our plan for, for going forward. Right. So um, just to close this out, and, and we can, I'll open it again if there's something in response to what I've said, but if you go back to the, um, the charter, and you can go to area five or the fifth and area talks about decision making. And that clearly outlines how the process is to be handled, which I believe we were in compliance with last time, although maybe it was a little bit sloppy. But it's clearly spelled out and it's as I just described it to you. So that's another place to check it. And then the last thing I wanted to do was um, again, John, this is to your question about consensus. I found online um, some information from MIT Harvard Public Disputes Program definitions consensus, which does not mean unanimity. Consensus means overwhelming unanimity. Key indicator of whether or not a consensus has been reached is that everyone agrees they can live with the final proposal. That is, after every effort has been made to meet in that standing interest. Groups or assemblies should seek unanimity but settle for overwhelming agreement that goes as far as possible to meet the interest of all stakeholders. So, again, that seems to align with the process we have in place. Does that sound right? Keep checking you because of like when there's a mistake or I've misinterpreted you guys know this stuff better than you. So um so that's what I have to offer about those items. Is there any question or comment about that? And I'm also checking our folks who are with us virtually, Priscilla or Tony or Kristen. Um I'm watching out for you all too. So if you have any comments, please unmute, um, speak up, raise your hand. I'll tell you honestly, it's so hard to understand what's being said that it's hard to comment on it. Do, do we just need to I'm, speak louder? It, it's it, an it's, echo. It, the speaker is not picking up um, people's voices very well. It's very choppy. Okay. And I can hear it, but it's just uh, very echoey. You just have to pay attention. So I have nothing to say at this point. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. 
Well, um, to that end, I'll encourage, uh, first off, I'll try and speak up. Maybe that will help or, and everyone can do the same, but also I'll encourage anyone who's not here in person to listen to the recording and perhaps that would be a bit clearer for me. Again, we can open this discussion back up at our next meeting of the evening. So, um, so that takes care of our charter review. Let's go to announcements, Patrick, talk about that. The, one, the um, announcement that was uh, brought up earlier that I was, I was going to make a, a point to, to bring up to you all, um, I told you before, February 6th, we are looking to have a community meeting in the Ridgely Avenue area. Um, a few weeks ago, we, we mailed out um, a notice of this community meeting to everybody along that Ridgely Avenue corridor to the west of Route 50 and then basically to the water. Um, in that area, and we've we set up an initial um, an initial sort of survey to get some um, get some pre meeting input from the community members about you know just asking the basic questions you know what do you, how, what do you envision for the future of this corridor what's um, what's working now what's not working what are what could threaten you know the future of this corridor those kinds of things and so we've gotten. The last time I checked, we had about maybe 25 to 30 responses to that um, survey so far. Most of those people indicated that they would be at the meeting. Um, the meeting will be at the Knights of Columbus um, facility, um, Soaring Timbers. Yeah. yeah, on Dubois Road, uh, behind the Catholic Church there. So um, anyway, you all, SAC members, you're more than welcome to join us. The point is to talk about um, the future of that area. It's a, it's a little bit of a strange area because you've got uh, a lot of single family residential in the area with um, some larger office buildings and some of the larger churches. It is kind of a question in our mind, you know, what what is the, the future of that area? Um, there were a lot of uh, land use change applications during plan 2040 along that corridor and um, several of those applications were the council action was to defer to the region plan and community discussion any future um, determination of uh, uh, future land use in that area so so that's that's what we're doing is going out to the community and trying to get some of that input <clears throat> what date and time again one more time Patrick February 6th at from 6 to I think we said 7 30. Um, and it's at the Knights of Columbus facility in there. Is there any way to see the comments before the meeting? Um, I talk about that, but we can, yeah, we can share those. To uh, take Barry's send in any comments? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't, I believe I mean, we stopped at Dubois Road. Community, so I don't know. I believe we stopped it. The mail out at Dubois Road. We captured the, the properties across the street and through the water. Oh, um, okay. for the, because the, the area that we're really looking at on Ridgely Road is from the corner of Wilson Road, North Best State, to the, to the US 50 um, bridge. And so it's, it's sort of a narrow okay. corridor that we're really kind of focused on. And the, it's an area where the, the zoning is. is a bit of a hodgepodge there. So, um, but the, the idea is to get information and be able to bring it to you all to discuss in our land use and zoning meetings. What time is that? Six o'clock. Did you send out uh, a link to your notice or is it just, is it online? I can, I can send that to you all. I think that, I think I've only announced it at a prior meeting here. I don't believe that I said that. Yeah, I will, I will include that. Yeah, yeah. you can email your notes. That in our next reminder. Thank you. Any other announcements? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Sorry. So, hearing um, none, we're going to move into um, <clears throat> our continued discussion for the draft of the seven strategies. And last week we covered two. This week we're going to cover the remaining three. Um, no, well, today we're focusing on on five new ones based on the land use 
Um, Actual ladies, environment. Yes, yeah, we had five to discuss out of that bat. Right. Um, there was there was one that was tabled last last week regarding one of the housing strategies, <laughs> and we we've, we've reached out and we're we're trying to get some information. We don't have what we need yet for you, so that will have to come up at the February thirteenth. Um, so let me let me share my screen, or I mean, uh, advance my slides here. Um, yeah, tonight we, we want to focus really quick on the strategies from those last three uh, surveys that didn't didn't receive the the two thirds um, that that two thirds threshold of respondents. Um, or in our case, we we are also bringing forward a couple that did reach a, that two-thirds threshold, but didn't didn't have eight members of the SAC responding affirmatively. So we'll we'll talk about those as well, two additional in that regard. Um, so, so um, and as I noted, we're we're still coming through all of the SAC comments and um, looking to put together a spreadsheet that we would like to try to share with you all by the third, by February third. So that you all can review everybody's comments, all of this, and uh, can be ready to discuss on the thirteenth. Um, if you do have any additional thoughts, please you know email us quickly this weekend with any of your with any additional thoughts that you may have, um, and we'll try to get that incorporated into the spreadsheet as well. But we need any additional thoughts as quickly as as possible. Um, in terms of Number of respondents. We had ten respondents on the natural environment um, strategies, and then eleven on healthy communities and land use. And so I'll jump into this this first one that sort of rate, ro rose to the to the surface. And I'm going to move these guys out of the way so we can see. Um, <clears throat> this one had a number of comments. Um, the proposed strategy was um, to absorb approximately 75% of the new housing units in the region within the rural town center. And some of the comments, um, you can see they kind of ranged and, and they're captured on the screen there. Um, so the 75% number, just to, um, just to share, it was really based on the proportion of the remaining capacity for residential development that exists in um, in the parole town center versus the rest of the versus the rest of the region. And this was this is part of our holding capacity analysis that I'll be talking about in more detail when we get to playing these um, discussions. But um, but basically under our current zoning code, approximately 77% of the of the untapped residential capacity is within the town center. And that's that's seventy seven percent outside of the city. So I'm not talking about the city of Annapolis here. Um, projections show that um, we should expect about fourteen hundred new units by twenty forty, and that's within Region Seven, but outside of the city. So that's um, that was the thinking behind this strategy. Um, one of the based on one of the comments, um, I was going to suggest or at least throw it out there if we want to consider adding some language something to the effect of um, ensuring a, a proportional or a comparable county investment in infrastructure capacity to support town center growth maybe like a, a second phrase or sentence um, added to this strategy um, that's um, that's that's all I'm going to say about that what what comments questions Thoughts does anybody have? And and folks online, I'm I'm looking at you all too. If you have any anything you'd like to say. So I'm sorry. Go I just think it's just incredibly restrictive. You know, between affordable housing, workforce housing, and market rate housing, you're trying to put everything just here into the whole housing. The the town center is essentially the only area within Region 7 that's designated by Plan 2040 as our targeted growth area. And so it is kind of the, the, 
the reason for being of the exactly that so that's the one the, the entire risk that we went through this in the recession but this is the only area in this region that can show so are there are there other areas of the region that you would suggest we we should be considering as as targeted well, we, we would need to definitely change zoning code on that which so it's a little bit of worms to redesignate other areas. But you know, my opinion is that this is just restricted to try to push everything into the full town center at the expense of anywhere else in the county that could benefit from public house or could benefit from full town. What I'm gonna well, everywhere else within region seven, right? So we're just talking, we're not saying 75% of you know, the majority of the jobs, right? In this county are. In region seven, yeah, good point. We want to reduce pollution, reduce travel time, reduce where people work, live, work, play. Office here. I I brought this map up um, on the slide to show um, going back again to the development policy area map from Plan Plan Twenty Forty, and we talked about this, so I don't want to beat this too much. But again, the remainder of of region seven, I mean, obviously there's the city and we're not, we're not developing policy for the city, but we have the, you know, the peninsula policy area, which, which by designation or definition is, is limited in terms of development in that area. The beige areas are neighborhood preservation areas, which are, you know, infill is to be expected, but again, sort of compatible to the scale of what is there now. And a lot of that is single family. Um, so yeah, it does kind of leave us with the town center. Unless, and, and, and this is something that we can talk about in our, um, in our land use discussions, but if we wanted to talk about, do we, do we want, we have a, a designation here of village center, and you can see in other parts of the county, we have small designated nodes that are commercial nodes, but they're, they're designated as village centers that can be, you know, developed in mixed use um, and, and somewhat more intensive ways, but at a, at a much smaller scale than a town center. That is something that we, we don't have anywhere in region seven. And so if, if we wanna discuss adding a village center overlay to any, any areas, and I'm not, I'm not sure where those would be necessarily, um, but that is, one option of, of a way that we might go about designating additional areas where we might apply a policy of this nature. Right now, if a developer wants to come in and put new units in parole, they don't have to provide affordable housing. It's not required, but it's, it is and will be incentivized. It can be, it can be sort of a, um, a, a of, of um, an amenity or, or whatever that is provided through the incentive program. But not, but not now. Someone could program. Yeah, they could now, yes. Anybody could could do that. But isn't that a recommendation? That you can... that, to... That you would have to have that kind of a requirement. Um, yeah, I mean, we could... Well, it seems like it goes back to what you were saying to me, Patrick, where you know, providing that the infrastructure was in place, you know, education is being funded. So I mean, you take, don't tell the other. So yeah, because wouldn't the high school application still cancel anything? It's been waiting for like six years. Much of, much of the parole town center is, is exempt currently from um, school IP up under certain conditions. Providing it's one or two bedrooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two of the comments from mine, Patrick, so I'll talk about these two. And I think your your adjustment to it about infrastructure is a good one. I think that's a step in the right direction for this strategy. I, I was with John where I thought that 75% is a heavy lift. Now I understand that it's actually 77 the way it is in the field right now, but I also felt like um, you know, there's a portion of the Pearl Town Center that's somewhat, art, somewhat artificial to create in this town center. But there's also the city of Annapolis. 
one of the things that we talk about all the time is connectivity, walkability. I can walk around Pearl Town Center, but can't walk through the city from there. It's not well connected. And so I was thinking that, you know, as, as much as this might not go along with everyone else's opinion, that um, adjacent opportunities, opportunities that are adjacent to the city, I think are important to look at. You know, maybe it's not the peninsula, maybe it's some other component, Westgate area, but I just felt like um, the 75 seemed like a heavy lift for that area to me. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't doing that by excluding other areas that could be opportunities. So I don't know how we would do that. And you might go question. back or keep a split screen on a map because it, you're talking city adjacent. What is what are you thinking? What are you guys thinking? Don't parole town. The, the management center knows as a pretty big geographical area, but you guys obviously have in mind other areas that you think that housing should be encouraged or planned for. I mean, the flip side to me is, is, is the infrastructure needs because we're, we're catching up. Like for me, like the Bay Ridge area, I mean, the Bay Ridge is all stretched by it. That whole area, you got a lot of paved, you got a lot of small shopping centers, could have residential people there could actually walk downtown to work. That is county. Right. Right now, if this actually happened today, all we would get would be a bunch of higher end, more condos in the world than the world county. Well, because of COVID today, it allows that to happen. Well, can't that change? Hopefully, but then again, you're still going to put 75 percent here, and you only have so many in the wall. So, if we actually want to change formal workforce housing, we have to allow in other areas, or it's just never going to happen. Well, I think that's. I think we have to talk about that because because I look at the flip side, and there is absolutely no infrastructure peninsula in to start bringing in that kind of housing. Certainly. Doesn't mean there can't be, but it's not it's not planned and we're playing catch up and parole. So what do you do for your 20-year plan? Do you create more problems in an area just because it's much easier for the developers to, to ramp up and get their projects done than it is for the government to figure out what they want to do and get something going? Or do you or do you focus and really make the parole town center the best gate area the best it could be? I mean, I, I, you know, I know what you're saying, but I, I look at how long it takes the county to catch up. You can put apartments in the giant parking lot above the job. There's like, how are you addressing the traffic? The traffic's bad now. There is no transportation. You're going to bring 600 units down on the fence. And how, how are you going to address that? Who's driving to me, right? Like that's I think right. Yeah, isn't no, that no, I mean that's I, I totally get how you see it, and and I think from that perspective, I'm sure it's very attractive. But and I would I mean that's the peninsula. I would argue the same for the world. Like, are there plans to grow the traffic infrastructure? Right. If you look at all the off ramps in and out of world, they're all single lane. Right. So we're growing, we're growing, we're growing. <laughs> We have plans to expand, like is there? Yes, there's there's been a whole mobility plan done for the parole. And, but if yeah. we're putting the, the housing um, in places where people work and shop and recreate anyway, I mean, you know, and I guess this is a philosophical debate, but wouldn't we expect there to not be as much of a traffic impact? I mean, if I could buy a home within walking distance of Heritage Complex and my son's daycare, you know, I wouldn't have to get my car. My husband and I would never have to get our car because we work. And that's from the rural management. So that's yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's right. an example. But I mean, that could be, I'm saying that could be for any area where there's jobs are located, stores, recreation, and things like that. So, well, that kind of goes to something I wanted to think about later about looking at targeted areas within Region 7 as opposed to just talking in generic sense about, about the area because it, people in, for instance, the Annapolis Neck area. I mean, they drive off to go to work and they drive off to go to medical services, and they drive off to go to school. So they do not, there is not an opportunity 
it's, it needs more infrastructure and public transportation. There's so much that has to get developed to allow to have that kind of village center. I mean, the only concern I have is I live Hong Kong, Tel Aviv, New York, Miami, with all around the world. And sometimes you have to sit through three or four or five minutes. Before that, you provide a program. You provide a workforce out. You know, other places where people can live and work and recreate. You know, what is the test that we want to use for traffic to say that people can't live? It's the test. I, well, I think we should have a very healthy discussion about that because because I don't agree that I think it's it's safe for what people expect in the areas of Region Seven to sit through four or five cycles, and and they do. I mean, Chinkapin Round Road, they do. Sit that. I mean, we talk about secondary crashes. We talk about the panic that families have if they're sitting for. Lights for hours trying to get through traffic in the peninsula. So, I mean, I respect inner city living as a different concept. This isn't inner city. People didn't move to Annapolis to have that kind of environment. They did. That's not why they're here. Right. So, we're working against traffic time reliability. Aren't those measures that are in other initiatives working against this is that? Right. Right. Con we're fighting kind of other initiatives, right? Like other accounting. Right. So let me make sure I understand what you're saying, because I think I understand what you're saying, John, is that you know there there it's a heavy lift for this one area. There should be attention paid to opportunities for other developments in other areas that would reduce maybe the demand in that one spot. And that could be infill development or any other opportunity we can see. And Lily, I hear what you're saying where. You've already got problems in areas that aren't in parole that you haven't solved, and it doesn't appear to be an easy way to solve those related to transportation. You know, easy getting around that type of thing. Is that right? So, um, so let's go back to the strategy. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to tag on to Lily and say that we also have areas in the county that don't have that problem yet, <laughs> and we're looking. I think there are neighbors. Folks that would really care about not creating more of that. And you know, one thing that I notice all the time is the fact that it's you might you might actually live right next to where you work. That's not where your kids go to school. And you're going to get in your vehicle and you're going to take those kids every day to school. Right. So I'm hearing all of that. And so um, let's go back to the strategy. I think. Um, You know, I'm willing to step off of um, my potential adjustment down for the number, and I'm also um, willing to um, step off of my statement about there could be other locations for multifamily mixed use because I think we'll have to just find those. I want to make sure that the code reflects when we make our recommendations, and it's in other areas that we'll make accommodations to to try and find places for those to happen. But I'm respectful of what the other side of the group is saying is like, look, we get it, but we really can't handle it in the places that we represent. So um, I'm willing to drop my my, my um, <clears throat> concerns about this for the group. Yeah, I, I think the county has to be the infrastructure as well. Of course, you know. of course. I think Patrick's statement that he added the infrastructure component here was. Mm -hmm. Everyone agree with that? Well, I think we have to look at that too. I'll speak up. I think when we start adding more infrastructure, we're making other changes in our landscape. And I think, I guess I'm curious again, what's that mean? Is that more highway, more road development? Is that more, more lights, more? I'm, I'm asking questions. I think in the, I think in the parole area, it, it's the parole is largely built out. Um, the mobility study that I mentioned in my in the presentation that I did for the master plan, um, that there are a few new road connections, but but not a significant number. I think I think a lot of the transportation improvements are 
going to come in the form of um, lighter things within the existing footprint of our of our right of way. I mean, whether it's light, you know, timing, then maybe more signals or um, an additional multimodal. I mean, we're not we're not talking just auto oriented in the town center for sure. A big piece of it is making sure that we have decent transit connections that are that are workable and and that work for people who need that transit. Um, but also, like it. I also think it included like alternative paths to get in and around, trying to include the secondary um, path from one spot to the next. So that was also interconnections and parallel roads. Yes, yes. yes. So what we can see with the redevelopment going on right now in Pearl, they've already dramatically improved walkability in terms of you know doubling the sidewalks and, and making that much more walkable. So I'll take the fence out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Patrick. I, it looks like Tony has a stand up. Yes. Okay. Hey folks, I'm just wondering at what point were those 1400 con um new units get close to saturating region seven. Who decides so, that? We can make our recommendations. Um, the the fourteen hundred number is based on the the latest projections out of the um, Baltimore Metropolitan Council, and that's that's over the course of 20, 20 years or, or by twenty forty. Um, but it in terms of saturation, you know, our our analysis showed that our current zoning code. Could actually accommodate more um, more housing units than that currently. If we made no zoning changes whatsoever, we could. We're, we're not going to reach a saturation point in terms of, at least in terms of zoning. Mm -hmm. So, does, does that answer your question, Tony? That that answers part of my question. But I'm, I I just I'm jump jump to something right now. Leaving Home Depot. If you want to get to um, Route 2, you go to Route 2. But the aerial view of where Home Depot is and where Harbor Center is, it looks like a possibility of an access road there uh, that, that could be done. And maybe even possible too from, from the same area to uh, Weaver Road. Also, as I see every day coming out of Annapolis on 97, the traffic coming from 50 going east, but going to 97 north. That lane that is there, Someone needs to consider that being a third lane to continue mm -hmm. so that the bottleneck does it's because it's going to increase. If you're talking about that many units, that's not one person in the unit. That could be anywhere from one to five, six people in a, in a unit. And uh, that's definitely going to increase the number of cars on the road. Mm -hmm. So that's just something I think we need to consider while we're talking. So, um... Again, I'm just trying to keep us moving forward in a way that we can close this out. Um, one of the things that's kind of open-ended right now is what's going to happen in the best case. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that may be an opportunity to look at a village center. Probably see if that makes some sense after we hear from the community. There. Okay. I okay. am very sensitive to the, to the limitations on the peninsula. Okay. Out of there. Um, that said, I, I think smaller developments with missing middle housing there. You know, I, would, I would like to make sure there's opportunity for that. Even if it's not significant numbers, you know, there, there is advantages to providing smaller groups of homes there. So that's just an opinion not to share. But back to the strategy. Um, can we reach consensus on moving forward with the strategy as it's drawn up now with the um, revisions that Patrick has described? Yeah, I'd, I'd say a, a revision, maybe a parole town center semicolon, um, ensure a proportional or maybe a different word comparable um, county investment in infrastructure capacity to support town center growth. In, in the parole town. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. how does everyone feel about that? How many state roads do you have? It's not just the county, is it? You, you have state roads in the in Annapolis. You have state roads. I mean, West Street, Generals Highway, Defense Highway, uh, Route Two, Harris Town. 
four strike. Oh, There's part of spa that's state. Huh? So that's what right. do you mean when you say you might want to broaden it, Christina? I heard you say county handling infrastructure. Ah, oh, good point. Okay. Ensure a proportional, um, well, maybe just ensure a proportional investment in Can infrastructure you type capacity. In, there in red and let us see, <clears throat> let them see what it's going to look like. So, with the county not having any um, authority over the state or the city, how do you guys coordinate with them when you need infrastructure work for them? So generally what happens is the county does a transportation priority letter that goes to MDOT every year, identifying the biggest um, projects that they want to see happen. And sometimes if the county wants to expedite, they may have to put some money in, you know, um, some cost sharing. But that is where, you know, like all these projects are leading up into that transportation letter. It's a pretty big plan. Yeah. Right. called PFA or something. Well, that's a priority. That's a different area. thing. A dip, yeah, but I mean, but I've seen that letter. It goes in yes. and it has the transportation projects prioritized. That has to get dogged mm -hmm. with our representatives at the state level and make sure that they get get those projects. Once it goes in, I don't know a lot about how then you know, because they're getting one of those letters from every county. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. And what do you do with the city? Say to the city, infrastructure mm -hmm. work. You have any kind of formal way of sending projects to them and saying, we really need you to do something here? That might be a question for our transportation, Office of Transportation. Um, it's not really a function, and it's not a function in the office of planning. And, planning. and I don't know the answer, so I'm not going to fake one. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I just there's yeah, a lot yeah, of inter jurisdictional know. issues. Right, but if you think about the city, really, it's like what can they do for us? I mean, the roads that they control aren't aren't the major arteries. Well, I don't know that all the infrastructure we're talking about is roads. Yeah. I think they put up all the bus shelters and some of them are absolutely pitiful. They put up sidewalks or they right. don't put up sidewalks. So there, I mean, there's bus stops that don't have sidewalks to them. And that would be a city response. Right. And, and also they close off certain neighborhoods to through traffic because that through traffic is, has become a problem. So you assume all the streets lead from point A Understood. Understood. Um, Patrick, I'm not going to ask you to try and type that in during the meeting. Can you just read that one more time? Or unless you already did it. I did. Yeah. Absorb approximately 75% of new housing units in the region within the Pearl Town Center. Ensure a proportional investment in infrastructure capacity to support town center growth. Can you make the view larger? Um, Please. I don't have my hand. Yeah. Patrick, I don't know if you want to see the personal. I might just leave it over. For an investment infrastructure. Okay, so um, we've made the adjustment here. I, I'm, I'm not sure it's perfect, but I think it's better. And um, we're going to have a chance to take another look at these, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say let's decide if we can agree to to accept this one three consensus. Anything else we have seen how it's written and adjusted? So can we make a motion right now to accept this? Well, there's no need for a motion if we decide um, through consensus that we're in agreement. Okay. Very good. Okay. That's a lesson I learned last week, so don't worry about that, Tom. Um, all, so I think that motion carries. We're going to say that it does. Um, let's let's move forward to the next one. And thanks for everyone's input. Um, okay. 
Review and update the county code to improve the retention of natural features and replanting of native species when developing or redeveloping, especially in peninsula policy areas and critical areas. We had several comments on these um, or on this one. Um, varying from the current policies are too restrictive to just simply emphasizing the retention aspect and then um, about the peninsula policy area, which um, which I was showing in the prior map. Yeah. Um, so just, just know that current provisions uh, related to protection of natural features, they're all throughout the code. We have, you know, the forest conservation provisions, steep slopes, critical area, they're um, all throughout the code. And the intent really is just to strengthen conservation within the peninsula policy area and within the critical area. So uh, is any revision needed to this? Strategy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the first comment is mine. I think that current policies are already overly restrictive. Again, um, <laughs> so I say that because I know how hard it is to do pretty much anything in the critical area. The reforestation policies are really their owners. It's very difficult to do work here. At the same time, we have these shortages of certain types of housing that we're trying to accommodate. So this only says, especially in peninsula policy areas, critical areas. You know, if it was just for those two, I would say, sure. I mean, I get that. But there are other areas that I think the current policies are, you know, I mean, if I were looking at them, I might say, my goodness, you know, I plant three, three trees for every one I take down to provide a development in, in, in a town center or urban area. It's really, um, you know, the cost is exorbitant. I'm not sure that the benefit is there. So that's just the way you know. The three to one ratio that that only applies to the critical area, right? So that doesn't. So is the town center located in? It's not. No, no it's not. So. And. So if it said it said anything like you no, know, just the peninsula policy and critical areas, rather than especially saying yeah. Yeah, I don't feel bad. Too much. Wait, say, say that. Yeah. See where it says especially? Uh huh. If you take especially out. I, I, I lost your rationale. Uh, um, because um, I'm sensitive to the importance of, of maintaining canopy and everything else in the most sensitive areas of the region, which I understand to be the critical area. And I agree that the peninsula makes sense to me. I'm not so sure I'm concerned about it elsewhere to that to, to that extent. Yeah, this may be surprising considering my background, but I I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I not 100 percent obviously, but you know, I, well, critical area is very important to me and to make sure that we maintain really strict replanting and retention requirements. But um, in places that are already developed, I'm wondering. This would create a burden on affordable housing. Well, then again, going back, they're not. I don't. I think there are a lot of areas in our county. I added a comment about I think the critical area in a lot of areas that I look at is small. And so there are areas that, in my opinion, need to be protected um, that aren't showing up in the lines of the critical area. Mm. So is that a different, neighbor, that be a different recommendation as, well, as to look at the, I think that was kind of one of my questions. Not Where are these? That. I'm just saying there's something in between these two extremes. Yeah. Or what I'd like to say. I, so I think if I'm hearing you correctly, it might, <clears throat> it, it might be, because um, I had kind of a similar thought. Do, is it, is it really that we need a an additional strategy if we if we eliminate especially in uh, or the word especially and this is this one then is purely uh, focused on the peninsula policy area and critical area and then do we need a second strategy that promotes um, stormwater take yeah I, ta taking a look at Flexibility in 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 the more in the more targeted growth areas like the town center. 
is, is that, I don't know if I'm understating everything that was just discussed. That sounds on point with what I was saying, um, but there's <laughs> lots of others. Do we have already in plan 20, I think we probably have like the encouragement of natural, yeah. like retention of natural features and replanting with native species already in plan 2040. You're probably right. And I, I didn't bring so that, that with me. Um, and maybe you. steep slopes. I mean, is steep slopes considered? Is that included in the peninsula policy? This, well, no, but it's included in. So natural features is defined in the code, um, and it includes floodplains, steep slopes, non-tidal wetlands, and basically the way the code is written, you're not supposed to disturb those areas. So the only way you disturb them is through a modification, which is approved by the planning and zoning officer. So, I mean, when I Maybe look at this, those. Maybe that's what I'm asking. when I look at this and review and update the county code to improve the retention of natural features, the code is already written in a way to protect natural features, but we do have the escape valve, which is the modification, which goes through review. Uh, because I don't know based on this, like I, so I try and take these strategies and think about what we have and how we could parlay that into something different. This one, I'm really not sure what we would do um, because number one, natural features are already protected. Um, Replanting of native species when developing or redeveloping, especially in peninsula policy areas. See, that's a code requirement too. Yeah, I mean, There's in the critical areas, plant. you have to replant with native species in the critical areas. It's been that way since the inception of the program. Um, a lot of peninsula policy areas are going to be in the critical area, but not all of them. <clears throat> so that's there's a, there's one other. strategy I'm hearing is that maybe there are people that would like to see a redefinition of some policy areas or the critical areas or just a, a, a reassessment of whether they're covering. Clarious, defined by state? Yes. yes. That's, that's 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 well, peninsula policy said. Yeah. Could be another way to do that. Yeah, and I think that was the intent here was to, to really expand you know some of these protections a little bit wider at least to the to incorporate all of the peninsula policy area that's you know oh, okay. that's otherwise not within critical area or other specifically defined we know i mean the strategies we have so many of them doing it's hard to i think many of them overlap with existing regulations <laughs> Christina spoke to that a little bit. In my mind, this is somewhat redundant in its entirety from what we already have in place. And so I, I, I would agree. It's, what was the basis of putting this up here? I guess that's probably. I think these were comments from earlier discussions when we were reviewing things like land use strategy. Is, it, is the peninsula policy have some clear requirements at this point? I thought that was a So the peninsula policy areas inform the planned land use map. Right. Um, and I mean, I can read what the peninsula policy area definition is, but it is, again, it's our broadest terminology. It's a policy area leading to planned land use, which then informs zoning. So I'm back to where I started. I'm like, well, I'm not sure we know this one at all because we're all not sure what it's doing in relation to what's in place right now. And I'm reluctant to add more complexity to our offerings by having more that we're not sure. I'm just wondering who, who felt there was, I mean, I, is there a concern that it's not a strong enough section of the code? I don't understand where the strategy is. <laughs> I think it was an attempt to 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 um, acknowledge the peninsula policy area and I like <laughs> that's a new concept. You know, I think there was a general, you know, there was a lot of people in our group who expressed 
uh, desire to, you know, protect the, our environment and international space. Um, the character but, of the neighborhood. But if, but if we feel like we're doing it, then and we don't in need this, way, this yeah. then, yeah, then let's then let's cut it. I mean, well, I'm curious about this modification approach. I mean, it sounds like people do work around it. Well, and I'm curious how that. What is that? Oh, that? And maybe that's why it's. Well, things like steep slopes and, and you just can't develop. That's mm -hmm. just they're, right. So they're not. I mean, you, you're the expert. I'm not the expert. <laughs> I do not know everything. <laughs> it's just not really a huge issue, right? Like, there's not. A, you're not getting a lot of requests to develop. Like, you're more yeah. steep slopes, mm -hmm. things like that, right? There's there's a lot of development in critical areas. Yeah, yeah but um, that's true. Sure. But it's heavily regulated, right? But there are there are opportunities in areas of space neighboring properties. And that's what we that in our community, that's what we get all the time because we have steep slopes going right down the park. Right. And that's that's constant. And you know, there's a feeling that people should be able to use their, their properties the same as their neighbor. And their neighbor may have done that in 1930. That's harder and harder to do these days. Really, it's about uniqueness of the use of the What's that? That's an ongoing thing. That happens all yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but um, well, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's as applicable to what we're talking about as it is to existing in most of those cases. I don't. Think it's <clears throat> I'm, I'm just trying to understand what. I think, I think the value add here could be that like focusing on the replanting of native species and then calling out peninsula policy area. And so you may not agree with that, but it's sort of saying expand or, or encourage or review and update the code to improve the retention of, I don't know that natural features is necessarily as applicable since that's already required, but maybe replanting a native species when developing or redeveloping in the peninsula policy area, almost like extending what's required in the critical area to the peninsula policy area or encouraging it at least. Uh, and, but plan yeah. 2040 is already calling, it's not specifically calling out peninsula policy area, but it is, there, you know, there's a strategy to increase But this came from someone in this group, right? Well, the strategy was provided in our list. Right? Well, but yeah, the strategy is a result of discussions that we've yeah. talked about. So we plan everyone's work. I know that I have an interest because of the work I've done with the Action Network and the <clears throat> beauty coalitions that the Peninsula Policy areas get better defined and established in, in the planning documents. So I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if this is exactly get to that kind of west. I mean, it, I'm glad to see peninsula policy being talked about as an area that we, we're being more aware of and, and managing <clears throat> the development, but so I don't know if that's just a separate, maybe we can come up with a separate strategy to just um, more clearly define peninsula policies and the criteria in those areas. So we're gonna make not do this to, So we're gonna make an attempt to um, preserve better portions of this strategy and do what we're right. hoping it will do. Perhaps you could read review and update the county code to approve in intention and intention of natural species, intention of nat and replanting of natural species when developing or redeveloping in the peninsula policy area That's, and critical area. So I'm not happy taking out protections that we know we have with natural features. Well, yeah. it's already in there. I know that it's fine to repeat it <laughs> as far as I'm no, concerned. I don't, I don't see any reason why to change that. So there's this. I'm sorry. That's, okay. I mean, that's why we're here. We're yeah, trying to I, just, I, mean, I think where we can make this go. We can. There's already a county wide policy. Sorry, my. I mean, the computer keeps 
around, but it's um, I found against expand the amount of forest and tree canopy cover across all watersheds. There you go. But that's already in plan 2040. And so it's where so are the lines on that? That's across the board. That's across the that's whole the couple county. county, because even urban areas need additional tree canopy. Um, you know, and then there's a whole <clears> set of <throat> strategies for accomplishing that. Maybe it is more of an open review and update and consider um, what we're saying, improving language. I don't know. What right. right. So the, the, if, if it's a strategy it. already in 2040, we're not emphasizing in our region ones that we feel are important, or how, how are you guys? I think if there's some, if you, you know, look at the set of strategies yeah. and if that doesn't adequately address a specific area within your region, then we would need to be more specific. Given given that it's in 2040, why don't we just get rid of this? The whole proposed strategy? Yeah, it's I mean, it's redundant. I don't think it makes sense to be redundant. So waters down the effect, the importance of what we're adding to the 20. Or if it's possible. Can, I and if we don't understand it, it's, it's not going to get implemented. <laughs> yeah, we can being able to be clear about it. So, how do we feel about that? Do we have so a consensus on yeah. yeah. um, eliminating the strategy in its entirety? Um, yes, if we can come back and maybe look at some kind of strategy about school policy. I think that's fair. Okay. That sounds right to me. I'm happy if you have any that. thoughts on that, if you can send them our way. Yeah, yeah. That's that's right. Right. yeah. yeah. you can come up with some language that you think does what you were hoping it would do. I'm sure yeah. you would support yeah. that. Yeah. Right. So and I'm happy to talk that sounds good. <clears throat> it sounds like we have consensus on that. Certainly yes. On the opposed. We see any hands up there, Patrick? I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. I do not. Okay, so we're going to move this along and eliminate the strategy and come back and look at one that mm -hmm. clearly addresses the concerns we have about the state policy. Okay, next. <laughs> well, the next two are natural environment strategies, so <clears throat> kind of building on the discussion. So, <clears throat> okay, so the original strategy was evaluate reforms to forest conservation ordinance to provide flexibility to replant areas previously developed in such as spaces. <clears throat> so this strategy, it came from uh, this conversation in the region two group, their natural environment meeting it was brought up by a stakeholder, and um, I guess the conversation kind of started with them talking about how there are already developed areas of the county that have low tree canopy, and wouldn't it be nice if, when doing uh, mitigation for, for forest conservation, if those trees could be planted in areas that were already developed where there's low tree canopy. So it was, I think the strategy, the way it was worded was a little bit confusing. I've suggested a revision. Uh, yeah. So. <clears throat> Got our virtual folks parked on top of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, evaluate reforms to the forest conservation ordinance to provide flexibility for forest mitigation to occur in developed communities with low tree canopy, such as homeowners. So it's just calling out that this is for forest mitigation to occur and then <clears throat> adding that bit about low tree canopy. So, uh, so for example, like a developer could cut down force in one part, but mitigation planting would take place in, a, in an already developed area. Is that like an example of how that would work? Yeah, so I think it's, it's well, and it's, I think it's evaluate the forest conservation ordinance to allow for flexibility. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that it's, so the way the Forest Conservation Act works is that typically on-site mitigation is preferred. There is a, 
a list of prioritized places for um, afforestation and reforestation. Offsite is at the bottom of the list, and there are a couple of different offsite things. Actually, I mean, I went in and I looked at the regulations today, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's prohibited right now, as long as there isn't some other easement already there. Yeah, because I know in Howard County, this has been a big issue. They've seen a big migration of uh, uh, <clears throat> heavy development in the east, close to Columbia, and then all the trees have been planted in the western part of the mm -hmm. county. So they actually did some revisions four years ago to their force um, conservation law. Um, so I, I'm just, that was just the first thought that came to my mind of something that we should maybe be concerned about, but I, I'm open to discussion. It's an interesting concept. Well, the strategy, I think, is focused specifically on looking for opportunities if we are going to allow for mitigation that's not on site to do it in, in previously developed communities with low canopy. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's really hard to find places to replant that aren't on your site, and they have to go into the easement, and they have mm -hmm. to be in perpetuity. So basically, if I have land and I'm going to let you do reforestation there, I've decided I'm never going to develop it and trees there and the density is limited. So it's, you know, it doesn't exist, frankly, because the cost is prohibitive. So it's really hard to do that. Yeah. But if there was a mechanism where you take that requirement and feed it back into areas that are low in canopy, it seems like that's worth looking at. It would really provide benefit you know, in areas that are kind of so far right now. Yeah, and I agree with that. I, I, I guess what I don't want to see, I agree with that in, in Region 7 specifically, because there's there's not a ton of like large contiguous mature forests left in Region 7, right? Um, I'm just getting concerned about like South County, where we do see these huge swaths of, so we're clear cutting acres and acres of forest, and we're just going to replant them in places that are, are, have already been, you know. I mean, it only works with space. this strategy in, in kind of smaller increments. You're not going to tear down a forest and try and feed that back into a developed area. Yeah. But there are opportunities, like you know, even for smaller developments that are having a hard time getting the trees on. It's like, well, perhaps if we gave them some relief and let them put it somewhere else in the county, yeah. specifically in Region Seven, where we could, you know, benefit from that. And the existing residents there could benefit from it. It would be nice to be able to do that. So all this says is evaluating forms. But isn't that already? That's an option. No, it's not an option. Because she it's just really said it's the lowest. I it's not think. Um, well, it's not prohibited. I've had we've had folks play around with this and put trees, take it off of a property and put it somewhere else, and so it happens. Well, it now. does happen, but it's very limited because again, if you do it in one number, you've got to make an easement for that. Right. The homeowners don't want to grant. Right. So, so they I mean, can't build. Impossible. So in theory, yeah, you could do it. In reality, it doesn't happen, but for very few yeah, but opportunities. That isn't that wasn't that the goal is not to make it easy to. So um, here's the thing, though. So it could get evaluated and determined that this won't work, or it will work. If it will work, legislation has to be written, which then has to go through the public process of creating legislation. So. It's a recommendation to evaluate something. The last one we looked at, I really wasn't sure what anyone was getting at or what that could look like. This one is more concrete to me. And I, you know, it, it's either feasible or it's not feasible. And even if it is feasible, it may not be politically feasible. But I think providing the flexibility for afforestation or reforestation uh, to occur maybe in areas we haven't previously considered is not a bad thing. Especially well, I think there's other ways to replant areas that have that have developed in the homeowner association. So there's other programs to bring trees in and I feel like it waters down something that Environmentalists fought a long time to make sure it was into the code for development. I, don't I mean, except for the fact they can do off-site mitigation now. So, 
That's right. So, That's right. What, so this is. This I don't think there needs do. to be more flexibility. They can do it. Why do this again? It's well, like the last one. Well, that's just that's just my opinion. Okay. Can we get the consensus on the second statement, the revised statement? Does anyone have strong objections to how it's written as it's revised? Yeah, I just don't. Okay. So absent a con uh, consensus on this one, um, you know, I think there's a there's a majority of people who feel that the revision is worthwhile. So I'm going to call a vote for the for the revised one. Give me one second to process this. Sorry, I'm reading <laughs> and trying to listen. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're still here. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll hold on the vote for a second here. And um, I think we have a couple other people who wanted to either process it or, or make another comment. So, Linda, you said you might have something to say. Well, and it's not, it's not specific to this strategy, so I apologize for that, but it's general information. And it, if you don't work with this every day, you might not be aware of it. But as an example, we have a 33 acre, I know they reach us. We have a 33 acre um, uh, old growth forest conservation area in the middle of our community. In the last three years, we've lost over 180 to 100 year old trees. And part of it's because they're, they're aging. Part of it is also because they were stressed. Um, this is the University of Maryland. I don't know what the, the, the state forester says, but uh, part of it was the, um, they were stressed with uh, Drought followed by wet seasons, followed by drought, followed by wet seasons, and, and they became stressed and, and started um, to try to heal themselves. And the beetles could smell this, this pheromone that, mm -hmm. that they were emitting. And the beetles came in, and they're absolutely devastating our old growth forest. So, what all I'm saying is that we, we right now are looking at a forest that was huge and healthy and three years ago. And in three years, we've lost 100 trees. I mean, trees, you and I can't put our arms around. And so I think that we need to think about, it's not just the trees that we're losing because of construction um, or because of housing. Um, it's because a lot of the trees that we've got in these beautiful forests that we do have are aging and dying. And so, I realize it's not specific to the strategy, but I spent most of the afternoon today dealing with a tree that had fallen out of our forest onto a private property and smashed a Honda CRV to about this high. And, so, and this tree looked healthy in June and it was dead in August and it's on the ground now. So I just I just wanted to share that information because I think that the, if you don't see it every day, you don't know it. So again, thank you for indulging me. I'm sure. Sure. I mean, you know, look, we're trying to hear everybody's point of view, but at a certain point, I think we have to make a decision about whether this strategy is worthwhile or not. And what I'm hearing is that I think I have a majority for this one. I say that I, as the chair, not as a position. So with that, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor of the revised um, strategy on the, on the table now. I'll ask for um, eyes. See Tony. Aye. Yes. Who else do we have there? I can't see if Priscilla, you have your hand up, and Kristen. How about opposed? Let's start with opposed. Let's see who's opposed to the strategy as it's as it's. Yeah, I was going with opposed because I'd rather see um, an, an alternative proposal. So I'm voting no. So I'm, I'm counting at least five that um, disagree with the policy as revised. So um, so we're going to strike the thing in its entirety and we're going to have to think about if there's another way to handle it, but this one doesn't carry. That being said, um, I, you know, one of the things I think is going to be good is, you know, the discussion is really helpful to have around this issue. And I know um, there's great concern on everyone's part. I mean, there's not like, the idea of tree banks in the county would be nice to look at as a place to start growth. 
you know, the old growth stuff do now that we could say, oh, maybe the county owns a bank. It's rather than say, well, it's naturally. So maybe we could talk more about those strategies as we get into our follow ups. Yeah, I personally really like the idea of more flexibility for forest conservation ordinance, especially as we're dealing with such a affordable housing crisis in Region 7 in particular. I'm just, I don't want to see it happen. That so I don't want to sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. understood completely. I think that's why I like you guys. So, um, so let's move on. Okay, so <clears throat> so what I'm going to do my best to explain this one also came out of a Region Two conversation, um, and I think it was born out of the concern that there's not enough maintenance of areas protected by forest conservation easement over planting. <laughs> And that IMP doesn't have staffing capacity or may not have sufficient authority to go back and make sure those forests are healthy five, 10, or 20 years down the road. Um, and contrast that with private land conservation easements that are required to regularly inspect and maintain their forested areas. So I did make a suggested revision just to add at the end um, to ensure forest conservation easements are being properly maintained. Think was the intent of the strategy, but of the that's right. Thing. You said I am. Oh, inspections and permits. Oh, I am. I got it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, performance bond at, don't they be, aren't they refunded? Yes. At, you know, as long as you meet the requirements, so within two years, or your your bond is refunded. No, they don't. They're not a long last. Well, so the, the, the bond goes way up to two years. The requirement to maintain the easement as per the agreement does not go. What this is saying is that it would be good if there was more enforcement of that easement post bond, is what I'm getting. Okay, so, so it's confusing me when you evaluate and inform of native performance bond and maintenance requirements. So, so I, I so you're set, I, I, don't, I don't know what the, I understand the maintenance requirement. But if the performance bond is refunded. Well, the performance bond is that you put it in place and when you turn over your project that you've done what you said you were about to do. So that goes away essentially when the project is complete. And so the not, maintenance bond is to make sure that you've done it and maintained it for two years. So I'm, my question is why why do we clear a performance bond in the statement then? Am I missing am I missing something? So what she's saying is forest conservation, like uh, we have a hundred acres conservation easement and we have to go in and do maintenance mm -hmm. we have a plan and we have to put money into taking care but this is a long term this is 10 20 years from getting it so Florence bond is gone um what is what are we contemplating as strengthening maintenance who's maintenance requirements and is that a longer term bond that's held or is it are there money in escrow i mean what where, where's the funding mechanism here? Because the performance bond goes away in two years and you still have this requirement, a long standing requirement. So I think, and I don't know, both of you can weigh in too. I know there's, I think, Cindy, you have a forest conservation easement on your property. You have to do like a forest management yeah, plan. Right through the state. That's, that's, um, okay. Of course, yeah. So forest. there are. Um, yeah, but how, what are we getting at? Because Probably have to do. You have to fund it. Oh uh, yeah, I have to. Sell. I have to take out trees. Right, and, the and, we, and, and that's what our community it. does. Yes. But I'm not sure what is this. So, are you suggesting we take out the performance bond component of this? That was my my thinking because I don't know what the purpose it has in this. Or I well, mean, you could you could make the case that the perform that the performance bond carries longer, perhaps. But you know that kind of thing. Yeah. You could say, well, you know, performance bond carries into the maintenance component of it or some portion. I'm not saying that's what would happen. Well, it's the, the you know, but the impetus is the inch to make sure that it's enforced after the funding is available. Yeah, I think like the that. concern was that like inspections and permits doesn't have staffing capacity or may not have the authority to go back and make sure that forests are healthy. like. 20 years down the road. So during the period of the performance bond, it's like, okay, the, the forest is, is growing, but then after those two years or whatever, it could be dead and 
Right. So it, I think it's just looking at how can we improve that so that we're ensuring that forests aren't just dying after two years. I would suggest <laughs> that we talk to INP about the existing program and if there are ways to maybe table this one. Question for you folks. This is Tony. Um, I hear you say special inspections and permits, but would that be inspections and permits or planning and zoning? It's inspections, inspections. and permits. It's we have a forestry division that's within the oh, that okay. department that that's they're responsible for this. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. So they're saying you inspect. There's not enough staff to go back to these easements and inspect them and make sure they're maintained. And there may not be sufficient authority to do that. So that necessarily isn't monetary. That's just a conservation agreement. To be. Well, they need to have a mechanism of respect, yeah, which right. is the problem. There's and so that we call for a revision to evaluate to the ordinance. It does need to evaluation of this part to, to strengthen. Maybe we we'll say it because I think by the owners, by the owner of the That's who does it. But we could explore other funding sources. I mean, part of that evaluation could explore yeah, what you yeah. know, mentioned, you know, around the bond or other, even other right, creative right. ideas to support a forest. So, you can say a portion of the bond money that is retained by the economy if there's a failure can be set aside to help with enforcement issues. Yeah. So those, that's why I'm, re I'm reluctant to separate the performance bond and maintenance Looking to separate because it might one might lead to a way to help solve the other. Right now, for instance, if if you don't request your performance bond refunded 180 days, the county keeps it because the county doesn't send it to you. Well, yes, but it's most like, people oh, have perfect. most people buy a bond; they don't post a bond. So yeah, we've done both. So the reason that people like to um, buy a bond is because it's only a fraction of the money and they right. let it go away. Right. Well, so we, they don't care. We've ended up doing both depending on what the project. Sure, and who we were working with. Yeah, but the, I would argue that the majority of developers are not buying that machine. So, again, they're not, they're, they're buying it. And it just evaporates. So, the county doesn't get the money. <laughs> right. You know, they get a small portion. So, back to the strategy. I mean, are we saying that we don't like it at all? Or are we saying that we want to? I mean, what are we saying we want to do? Does anyone have a recommendation or a suggested revision to go further or clarify it? No, I just didn't know what the issues were. So there's issues of funding for the staffing, and then there's issues of the landholder doesn't have the money to take care of their conservation unit property. There's two problems that were. Well, that's two that we're talking that we about today. There's probably yeah. even more. So this statement is saying to evaluate a reform if needed. And I'm saying, from my standpoint, that seems like it's a, not a hard one to get one. I'm mm -hmm. sure I yeah. we should be yeah. looking at that stuff. There's sure some improvements there. If needed. If needed, sure. So I go back to is a suggested revision. We have consensus on that. Real quick, are you saying? If needed or as needed? If needed. If. Hmm. Okay. We've already identified, I think, just in the conversations that we have a need. It sounds like. Well, I understand. I just want to make sure I'm hearing because I'm not in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there Thank any you. other suggested adjustments to this strategy at this point? Is there anyone strongly opposed to it? Okay, so I'm going to say we've reached consensus on this one. Revised. On the revised one, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, where's our next one? There was one last, um, it was a land use strategy that we skipped briefly. And um, this, this may not take a lot of um, conversation, but the strategy was revised the zoning regulations to provide greater flexibility in the redevelopment of small sites while meeting the vision of the region, consider changes to density allowances, setbacks, open space, and other provisions. Um, 
and the we we didn't have we we did reach that threshold of sixty seven percent agreeing with it, but it, we we just didn't have we only had seven people, so I thought I would at least bring it up here. But um, one one potential revision that we could offer here um, it could be to to add language into this strategy to specify that we're really talking about commercial, industrial, town center, mixed use zones, not so much um, residential um, developments here. And um, yeah. What about that, small sites? What does that mean? That's yeah. Does that mean you're saying commercial, but if you took small sites out and went to commercial, no, I'm saying um, uh, in the redevelopment of small sites within commercial, industrial, town center, mixed use areas. Oh, I like that. Small sites within. Well, why, why are we cutting out residential? I mean, small sites. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you, my, my neighborhood is, is just furious about the density changes and the setback waivers that are getting accepted. And um, they're just furious. Uh, the char character of the neighborhood they see it's changing and it gets waivers get approved. And somebody looks at one house out of 450 that got away with it, and that becomes standard. And I mean it's it's gotten very emotional in, in some areas, and people are concerned about loss of light and loss of maybe i know one tree doesn't sound like a lot but it's a big deal to to a, you know small street if trees are removed and so i'm just saying there's a there's a lot there small site there's a lot of opposition to that in communities so if if it was looking at that in uh, small sites within commercial areas, I think that's again the concept of let's encourage infill development where we already have development and infrastructure. What is it, uh, like accessory dwelling units, bonds? Are those currently allowed? If they're attached, if they're yeah. attached, yeah. Councilwoman <laughs> Rodian is. Is she either proposed a bill or has a bill coming <clears throat> right now for accessory dwelling units to expand them? Six point. So it's in. Yes, I, I like that in terms of, you know, so in that sense, I, I like that in residential, you can get adjustment in residential properties, but. Um, That's revising and zoning regulation in the residential. So, yes. yes, that was one. That was one instance where I'm, I kind of like the idea of expanding it to residential. Um, but you can still put in accessory dwelling units and not um, waive setbacks. Preserve open space. I'm kind of struggling to. I'm trying to like write in this. Potential revision. I'm kind of struggling, but can we can we visualize that after small sites, we potentially add you know within commercial, industrial, town center, mixed use areas, and does that make this strategy more palatable for everyone? Well, are you are you talking about saying only in the parole area? <laughs> no, that's not our only commercial areas you within the county. Can you repeat the same thing? Commercial industrial and in the redevelopment of small sites within uh, commercial industrial town center and mixed use town center and parole. It would be town. I mean, yeah, it would include that. Yes. But any mixed use area. Yeah, what's mixed yeah, use? So that would be we take we, we don't have mixed use zoning within yes. region seven right now, but we don't have we don't have as much of it as we need to get, but I think that's gonna be part of it. So question. On Reba Road, where uh, Admiral Cochran Drive starts, and then this new units, are they residential apartments? The ones that have you know? gone up now are residential, yes. And then there's okay. there's 2B office and 
um, retail along the front on Riva Road. So that, okay. that should be a mixed use site when it is built out. Okay. Yeah, what's a small Thanks. site, just like a single home? What's a small site, like a single one? It's, it's, well, this isn't, acre, acre. this isn't defined. No, it, I mean, it would be, I think, smaller than an acre. I think the smaller you go, the harder it can be to meet all of the, the setback requirements yeah. and the open space requirements and such. So it's um, it's really addressing addressing that. Um, no, I wouldn't think so. I th I, if we're talking smaller than that. I, I'm thinking like, um, for instance, Housley Road. Now this is within the town center, but Housley Road, there are some existing homes that are, because of the zoning and such, those, those can be redeveloped as commercial, but because they're, Small sites. There's uh, there's some real challenges, I think, to meeting all of the the you know setback requirements and all of that, and still having a viable project that is. You know, but a lot of times, system. redevelopment of small sites depends on an on an assemblage. You know, I mean, assemblage. I mean, when a developer goes and and. and you know, puts okay. a contract on four properties that are adjacent to each other to get a larger piece of property. Still a small site, though, in some senses. It's Maybe you want to just define what small yeah. site is. Maybe you Less just want to call it in. Still, that's possible. Infill sites, we know, see them both ways because they can't meet the requirement, but infill allows us with infrastructure needs and everything else. And, but infill to me means it's within some kind of commercial or it's not um, infill. I know that. I know that. That's why the definition is infill defined. Fill is it's any vacant lot or lot that you read, like if, if the house is a tear down. Where four of them are. I don't know yeah. if it's defined in code. It is in plan 2040, but. And so you're saying small site has the definition within the county code at this point? No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, okay. And I, I mean, I think this was. Crafted deliberately not to put a number on that. I mean, to, to be determined as this is evaluated and, um, you know, does it need to be a half, half acre? Or are we talking quarter acre? I, there's, there's a bit of analysis, I think, that needs to be done to sort of know how many sites we're talking about. I mean, in my opinion, redevelopment is just so critical for everything else we've got going on. Economic development, you know, environmental, Protection of existing forests and things like that. So I'm all for you know, greater flexibility. But, but how you want to wordsmith it, I'm not sure. Priscilla has her hand up. Yeah, I have a question. So if you look at a place like the Annapolis Fish Market, which is now abandoned and for sale, is that the kind of property that we're talking about? So they could come in and put in um, so, you know, a multi-unit uh, house you know, five a fiveplex or something, or is that the kind of situation we could be talking about? Could yeah, it it could be. Um, I mean, technicality, it's in the city, so <laughs> yeah. No, but 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 that is uh, that could be an example. Yeah, I mean, there are other examples of buildings that seem sure. to be abandoned that are on the other side of the road. But anyway, I'm very supportive of this too. I think it gives a lot more flexibility to the area. So, okay, we have the strategy up here. Um, there's concern about the, re the residential component of it. I understand that. Um, there is a proposal to add infill after small so that we can better define where we were targeting this effort. Um, I, I personally don't like the idea of um, separating zones. When you're looking at small properties because I'm trying to Make the best use of the infrastructure and infill sites um, have their own challenges because sometimes they were built at a time when they can't meet the setbacks. So my my proposal would be add infill after small. So that's that's my revised strategy. Question to the group is can I get consensus on that? Is infill defined? I'm looking right now. Give me a second. And I guess I'm confused. I thought we were, you're asking about the revised the way um, Patrick revised it too. 
Yes, yes. adding it to his. Adding yes, his. Yeah, the revised one with the addition of the so that we're not dealing with sprawl situations or smaller properties growing in different areas. We're talking about rivers already development left and right and adjacent parcels. Can I develop a small input with some of you? I really feel like infill. So I we don't have it in Article Seventeen. Um, don't have it in eighteen either. To me, infill and redevelopment are two different things. I see infill as the undeveloped lot in the middle of a lot of other lots that are developed, and then you're, you know, you're going to develop that with something similar to what you have. Mm -hmm. Redevelopment, I see. I know it's in the city, but I think the former um, Annapolis Seafood Market is an example. Like we're probably ultimately going to see that building taken down and something else put there. Mm -hmm. That's redevelopment. Because it's already developed, but we're going to redo it. So, then using that as an example, going east is probably important. Going east on like, um, the same street, going over like a block and a half, there was like a vacant lot there where at some point in time there was a small structure that's no longer there now. So, you would say that that would be. Yeah. Infill development refers to building within unused or underutilized lands within existing development patterns. Patterns. I'm sorry. Well, this, is, this is from the governor's office of planning and research, and this is. Yeah. I think that's it's a pretty good. I think it's a pretty good definition now. I mean, it's kind of. Um, but so the What's the difference? I feel that they are two different things. I see infill, so that definition refers to existing patterns, but maybe you have one lot that didn't get developed originally when everything else got developed, like all the buildings date from the 50s, but there's one vacant one for whatever reason. That's infill. And whatever you're going to put there is going to replicate the existing pattern that's already there. Redevelopment typically uh, it happens on underutilized sites. So maybe it was a building that did get built in the fifties. Um, they haven't been able to keep tenants in it. It's run down. But now something else there would be a much better, uh, a higher and better use for the property. So you're going to tear down what's there, and you're going to put something else there. Between the two existing strategies, there are already there's more incentive to put in the building. You're asking, are there more incentives? Yeah. I don't think so. So the thing is, I've been doing this close to 30 years. Redevelopment is, is typically more challenging. Uh, in places that I've worked before. I have worked on assemblages. So the first thing is you've got to get multiple property owners to agree that they're going to sell. Then, you know, you have to deal with lots of other things like utilities. Redevelopment is complicated. Um, and that's why, and we need it in this county. We definitely have undervalued properties. And now I'm talking beyond reach of seven, right? Although, like the Annapolis Mall. I mean, do you think the Annapolis Mall right now is undervalued? And maybe it's going to have some redevelopment. So you're you're using undervalued and underutilized as yeah. And okay. I think that's fine. I just trying to I'm not turn off. I think that would be the same. Okay. And so those are sites that are ripe for redevelopment. Um, it's like the Eastport Shopping Center. I know it's another city that of uh, Annapolis example, but the movie theater has been out of business for years. So that is ripe for redevelopment. You know, it's hung up, but um, because redevelopment is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Just, but infill might be a lot in Lily's neighborhood that was never developed. Maybe somebody originally, they bought two lots and they never combined them. And there's still 
an existing lot of record. And now the kids own it and they're like, you know, if we sold this, we could make some money on this. That is infill. The site was not previously developed. So I like tacking on something along the lines of replicating existing patterns. I think that's probably the place, I mean, literally <clears throat> had argues about everything that every project that gets developed. So I think um, in a residential setting, you're right. I'm not sure in a commercial industrial or mixed use. I agree. I mean, I, I I would be much more supportive of it in those kind of areas. I mean, you know, I don't know what's going on at the Eastport Shopping Mall, but I know that that theater has been empty in that lot for the sort of farmers market. Well, if if the community yeah, so. wants to replicate existing standards, it wouldn't be up to them to pass. The I was going to say, it, well, they and it's then it's up to the community, and that's something we're wrestling with. First, if we're wrestling with. Well, then we need to be. More strongly defining what we think are the well, the town is going to get exactly no I agree I know we know it and so and so that's what we're that so replicating existing patterns is something good and we can lock in on that and say what are what's the pattern in our neighborhood trying it's to not up to our legislation dictate how to do it I'm not convinced that that continuing a pattern that's not relevant today makes sense to me. So um, I'm going to go back to your first point, let's Lily, which is what Patrick's just talking there. And okay. let's just dispense with the residential okay. and stick yes. with the commercial. Yes. Uh, so I can get behind that. Okay. I don't, I don't, um, for, the, for the greater good, I would say that. Okay, so I just heard Christina say redevelopment and infill are two, two different things. So we've got them both in the same summit. So is that? Right. They're not okay. mutually exclusive. They just aren't. Um, they're not the same, but they're not exclusive. Mm -hmm. have redevelopment that's it. So, are you limiting it though by saying infill? Because it could be redevelopment that's not infill. Right? You can take infill out of it. That's fine. We're ever coming back around. <laughs> yes. So I, I feel better. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys got there on this. I do. I think so too. <laughs> so, do we have consensus on the revised strategy as presented on the board? Is there anyone who has a strong objection? I'm looking at Tony and Priscilla too. Are we thumbs up? It looks like we did pretty well. Um, do we yeah. Have a move that? And, um, I can live with it. Yeah. Okay. I'm good with it. Yes. So our time is 7.57. Um, I think we're done. I think we finished with everything we wanted to cover tonight. It was nice. It was nice to get everyone to provide commentary and, and the conclusion for the majority of them that everyone was satisfied with. So thank you everyone for the effort. Um, next steps, um, where are we heading next here, Patrick and Desiree? It's it's what we talked about previously. We're working to pull all the comments together into a spreadsheet that we can share with you all by the by the third, ideally. And um, our next meeting will be <clears throat> the, the I'm sorry, the 13th, Monday the 13th, here in the Chesapeake room. And as always, if you need a um, a virtual link, let me know. We'll make sure that you have that. Great. So, so can I talk to? I was going to say before we finish and we learn, I'd like to spend a few minutes um, give the floor to Lily to talk about what she's handed out today. Yeah, and and you guys, I will get something to you by email. And this just kind of came out of a conversation I had with Patrick, um, just about conceptually what what we're doing or where we can have some impact on our strategies. So I went back again, sorry guys, to the 2003. I really like the way that they laid out what they called at the time activity centers. And so I gave everyone a copy of just, just this concept. It could be called different things. I'm looking at some uh, smart growth community planning, Mesa, Arizona, and they call it, they have different terminology, but but what they did in 2003 was the small area committee identified activity centers. 
And then from those activity centers, what I thought made it cleared up for me what what my path would be in this committee would be within those activity centers, what are the community, what's the community character of that particular activity center? Because it's very different in the different areas, just like we discussed today. Some of them are more heavily in the critical area, are residential, and others are in the uh, redevelopment commercial. And then specify the community needs for each of these activity centers. And we talked about need of child care centers. Um, there are on Fourth Drive communities that would like to have more accessible medical clinics and things like that. So could we come up with within those different areas, what, what are kind of the top, say, five or six needs? And then establish goals for each of those activity centers. And those are our strategies, but maybe not all of the strategies we have right here <coughs> apply to every single activity center. Maybe they, maybe they apply to different ones. And that would make me, and we're starting yeah. to do that. So make me understand where this strategy is more uh, appropriate because it's targeted to these particular areas. And the goal of all that, that's why I put this gel, would be to preserve and or improve the quality of these particular activity areas. And then, so the, the bigger activities that we're going to be looking at are land use maps. And then I saw kind of a departure land use maps. One was desired improvements and development we're looking to the private sector money for that, developers, and that's we're looking at incentives, whatever. And that would really come from de developing zoning maps, drafting new regulation. And when I say drafting regulations, for more on a conceptual level, it's a question. Are we talking about incentives or restrictions or those types of things? And if we wanted to go on to desired improvements and development, and I'm looking at infrastructure needs that the taxpayers money is going to have to pay for or public private partnerships. And we really have to look at a capital improvement program. Pro what type of project initiation do you recommend? And that would be developing concept scopes. But it's a different process that I think we, I, I hope we can have some uh, meaningful strategies that look at this, this right hand side desired improvements that have to come through the taxpayer public financing. And that's the CIP program. So I mean, in my mind, I'm gonna try to come up with my own idea of where are the needs and where are these centers. In our mind, I just looked at a couple today and I, you know, we've been talking about Bestgate and Parole and Giant. So, I mean, you know, we're already in our minds thinking of some of these areas. And what are the needs of those areas? So that's kind of the process that I was looking at. And to make sure that we did have recommendations that follow the track of um, proposing capital. So what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, we have the side that talks about land use and talks about what the private sector has to do and should be for what we're hoping, yeah. for what we're hoping they'll do. Right. And then uh, at simultaneously looking at public sector or government side, what are we going to provide and how are we going to help them to facilitate yes. their ability to support the growth on the other side? So how do you make yeah. both of them work? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I think that's um, that's on the I think that's a lot of sense. So I think so. we can think about these strategies. Thank you. Anything else, anybody? Wants to talk? And thank you for bringing it forward. I think it's helpful. Does anyone else have? On something that you'd like to add. So, okay. thanks again, everyone, for working so hard and finishing the question artist and being here tonight. With that, I say we're adjourned. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Tony and Priscilla. Okay. Hey, guys. I'm so 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 I'm so